Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come back here at GGI. Always come back. Uh, very happy to come back. I spent here a sabbatical a few years ago. Okay, so the work I'm going to talk about is based um, the final part, if I have time to get to that, on a recent paper with Alberto Zaffaroni, and then I will spend a lot of the time a lot of time on on previous related work. Um, okay, um, there is a delay in. Sorry. Okay, so first the introduction. Um, well, first of all, I would like to say I tried to make this talk um, uh, interesting as much as possible for a different different uh, type of audience. I don't know, I probably failed, but I will see. Um, so my interest uh, is, one of my interests is about uh, geometry emerging from supergravity and by the holographic duality, whatever that means for, but just paraphrasing what was said yesterday, the same geometry emerges sometimes from quantum field theory. So that kind of motivates uh, why, why I'm talking at this workshop here today. Um, particularly interesting uh, is the case where, where we preserve supersymmetry. So, in all of my discussion, there will be supersymmetry preserve, although I will never write any single killing spinner equation in this talk. Um, so the context is extremely broad, and uh, I will focus uh, today and usually in my work on the classic type of geometries. So um, we have some often, we always have a Riemannian structure. Sometimes we have a complex structure, symplectic, and so on. More generally, you can say that we work in a situation where we have some group structure on the frame bundle. Another recurrent theme, although it's not strictly related to, super, to supersymmetry, is that of toric geometry, which will also play a role today. Okay. So uh, I slightly changed the, talk, the title of my talk. Uh, so I, I included also the word extremization in the title to reflect better the, the content. So I will start from here. Many supersymmetric conformal field theories can be characterized in terms of some uh, external problem. Uh, that, uh, that is a fancy word to say that there is a function that needs to be uh, extremized just uh, in terms of some parameters, which for the moment are some generic parameters that characterize the, the field theory. I call them epsilon i. So roughly speaking, the very existence of these conformal field theories is equivalent to the existence of, uh, of, a, of a solution to this equation here. If there is a solution, then under certain conditions, and you plug it back the, the parameter, the critical values of the parameter, then this object becomes an observable, uh, again, whatever that means, an object that characterizes the, uh, the field theory. It's not simply a number, it's something which may depend on all of the details that, for example, appeared in, in Sarah's talk, all of the uh, gauge groups, ranks, uh, representations, et cetera. Uh, when one of these conformal field theory admits a supergravity dual, then a natural question arises whether there is a geometric version of the corresponding extremization principle. And by supergravity dual, I mean a solution of a supergravity theory, uh, which is equivalent, again, uh, under the uh, um, holographic or ADS CFD correspondence to the initial field theory. A typical form of this supergravity solution is a direct product of an anti sitter space-time with, with an internal compact uh, Riemannian manifold, or in fact, sometimes an orbifold, equipped with some additional structures. So by definition, a solution is something which solves the equation of motion. So one, one might say, okay, this is exactly the extremization principle that you need, and that, that's it. Uh, there is nothing more, much more to say. That's not how it works. And in fact, uh, getting the geometric version of the extremization principles often gives some interesting new type of uh, geometry. So, um, I think I had uh, I had a slide with an, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was skipped. So that's the plan for the rest of the talk. Uh, I will spend, I will start from uh, old, even on math scale um, results, um, which is in the context of uh, extremization for Sasaki Einstein manifold. And then I will move on to um, old on physics scale, but new on, on a math scale because it's order of five years, uh, which I learned yesterday that the, that is the time scale. Um, and then the, the central part of the talk is even more recent result, which is in the past two, three years. 
I'm not sure how much time I will spend on that, depending on how how uh, how fast I'm going. Uh, definitely, I want to get to talk to the last part where uh, I will get to the recent work and uh, um, the the word um, the word of equivalent localization and supergravity. So for mo mo many people in the audience, this is very old stuff and possibly uh, well known and boring, but for some other, it might be interesting to, to know. Okay, the solutions here are um, anti the sitter five times samsa Saki einstein uh, five manifold in type 2B supergravity. And there is a physical picture, and this picture here is taken courtesy of Alberto Zaffaroni without him knowing. Uh, I just snatched it from, the, from a talk he gave uh, somewhere else. So we have a, we have a, uh, the picture is that there are some bunch of D3 brains uh, which sit at some uh, conical singularity. The conical singularity is a, is a, is a Calabial and it's the cone over the Sasaki Einstein manifold. The, uh, the function uh, in the field theory that needs to ex be extremized uh, turns out to be uh, essentially proportional um, to, the, to the inverse volume. And so one has to uh, vary over some uh, some parameters, which are uh, uh, basically related to the isometries of the Sasaki Einstein manifold, and um, and uh, um, in the field theory, uh, this uh, this process is known as a maximization, and uh, at the critical value you get the observable, which is the central charge. So now uh, this calls for the geometric version of this problem. What is that we are supposed to be doing in the in the geometry? And here where the uh, economization in, in Sasaki and geometry comes in. So re let, let's recall some basic facts about Sasaki and geometry. So a manifold is Sasaki, that, that's a possible definition which fits in one line, if and only if the cone is, is scalar and equipped with a cone metric. Uh, we, this is the, the, what I mean by cone metric, something like that. And another thing is that uh, on a Sasaki, uh, there is a canonical uh, unit norm killing vector, which is called rib vector. And uh, finally, uh, such a second um, manifold is, is Einstein, of course, if and only if, and only if um, the cone metric becomes uh, Ritchie flat. So uh, this is a theorem quoted from my work, uh, very old work uh, about 20 years ago with Sparks and Yao. Uh, a Sasakian volume is extremized uh, by an Einstein metric, which means that if the metric is Einstein, then then uh, this volume attains a, a critical value. Now, in addition, if uh, L is toric, so that there is an effectively acting uh, three torus, actually one notation here, this is a real torus for me. Uh, some, in some other talk, it was a complex torus. This is a real one. That leads to the uh, to a Hamiltonian action on the cone, uh, which is scalar and therefore symplectic. Then also the converse of this implication is true. And this was proved by, by these people here uh, a few years after our work. Um, in the toric case, that's one interesting thing, uh, one, one practically interesting thing. Um, the the geometry of the Sasakian is entirely encoded in a in a in an object in in a, which lives just in R three, uh, which is a polyhedral cone, thanks to a generalization of the classic Delzan theorem. So uh, this uh, C is a cone over a compact convex uh, uh, polytope, which is spec uniquely specified by a set of primitive normals. So here is a picture. Of the of job object, and here are some ingredients that we need in the in the construction. Uh, we have a symplectic form on the on the cone, so this is a non-compact scalar uh, 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 cone, and then there are naturally uh, natural uh, Durbo coordinates. Uh, phi denotes the angular coordinates, so any killing vector uh, can be expanded in in this in this basis, and then uh, uh, the moment maps uh, define. Uh, also, uh, which are the, the I, I denote them Y. Uh, there are three here. We are working in six dimensions for the moment. Um, and it turns out also that the, um, the, the Hamiltonian, the one defined, is, defined in this way, is also related to the, to the R square, the, the radial coordinate. So the Sasakian volume can be written in this suggestive um, form. Uh, it's the volume of the of a compact five-dimensional manifold, but you can actually, interestingly, rewrite this as, a, as an integral over a non-compact six-dimensional cone, uh, and the integral converges thanks to this uh, uh, exponential damping factor. But this is precisely the decimal hackman integral, and indeed it can be evaluated using a, a fixed-point uh, formula. 
which one has to apply to a partial resolution. So we come back to this to this point here of the um, of this expression towards the end of the talk, or a bit late, a bit, a bit earlier. Now denoting by epsilon uh, just these uh, triples of uh, of uh, entries, so like a vector in R three, then one can write this uh, uh, abstract uh, but nice looking expression in a in a less nice looking but very concrete expression, which now depends explicitly on the on the component of this uh, uh, vector field uh, and on this toric data. I call them uh, uh, this VA toric data, which uniquely characterize my my toric Sasakian. VA. Oh, sorry. I sorry. Yeah, good question. Sorry, I, I forgot to mention the notation is here. You uh, these are vectors in R three. You put them in three rows or three columns, whatever you want, and you take the determinant of the three by three matrix. Uh, it's an index that runs between one and and D, and and this uh, runs over all these uh, uh, facet of the of the cone. So I will. Typically, they note by little d the number of uh, of these uh, edges uh, of the polytope. If you are in these dimensions, at least uh, in general, it's the number of the of these facets. No, in the last line, this is, uh, is arbitrary. The the v are, are uh, have three components. They, uh, as this picture suggests, this is a picture of R three. So uh, so yeah. Uh, but there are as many uh, as many a uh, uh, number of, of these Vs as you want. Uh, well, uh, at least three, not not less than three, of course. So this is a pretty much this uh, and that's part of the three Yeah, these are yeah, exactly. I mean uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, you know, V1, V2, V3, uh, say A, A, A. V1, A minus one, et cetera, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, and the determinant. Okay, now uh, jumping uh, some 15 years later, another, uh, another uh, interesting type of, uh, of, of, um, of setup, let's say of, uh, of uh, geometry within uh, holographic interpretation is given by this. Uh, so you have ADS3 times M7. Now there is a seven-dimensional manifold in type 2B supergravity, uh, where, uh, at least to begin with, we can think of this M7 as constructed from a Sasaki-Einstein L5 fiber over some, uh, um, over some base, for example, a Riemann surface. So this is a way to think about physically, although then we can then uh, uh, kind of make it a more abstract, more general type of geometry, which I will des describe. So uh, the field theory is, uh, uh, in this case, uh, understood and constructed in two steps. One starts from the field theory in four dimensions, which is uh, uh, which has the data of the of the Sasaki Einstein, and then the data of the Riemann surface comes when you compactify this uh, this four, four dimensional theory and you get down to a two dimensional theory. Uh, the object that now um, is the observable that we were talking about is again a central charge. And is uh, geometrically in this solution is kind of related to something which is a sort of generalized volume, which I will make it precise in a short while, of this internal manifold. And again, this is kind of carbon copic story. You have to extremize this function in the field theory, and you get the central charge. Now, this again gives some ex expected or hoped uh, extremization problem in geometry. So one has to find a suitable class of metrics. Uh, and then on, over this suitable class, uh, define a, a suitable function that depends on the killing vector such that this is extremized. Now, differently from the older story, in this, um, in this newer story, uh, uh, the ty type of geometry is not a textbook geometry. So you cannot find it in any textbook, like uh, Sasaki Einstein. There are books that talk about that. Uh, and, and this was, uh, uh, well, this arose exactly in the context of, uh, uh, of uh, papers on uh, supergravity, holography, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of, uh, we took it out from there and, 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 and we can make it abstract and just, I can, I, I can feed this to any people, any person working in differential geometry and we'll be able to understand it. So uh, this was formalized mainly in this paper by Jerome and Napu Kim. So that's why we refer it to GK. That, that's why this GK appears. So here, I try to make it very short, uh, as concise as possible definition. 
Uh, a manifold has to be odd dimensional. You said to be a, a one of GK geometry. If there is a metric and, uh, and a two form, let's call it H, such that there is a canonical uh, unit norm killing vector, kind of similar to the Sasaki Einstein case, and that induces a splitting of the, of the metric. So there is some uh, transverse foliation, which is denoted by this T, uh, equipped with, with some uh, additional structure. So in this transverse uh, foliation, uh, there is a Kähler structure. So this has, this has to be Kähler. Um, and uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, straight. I mean, it's not a usual equation that this uh, has to satisfy, has to be Kähler, but then the, has to satisfy this fourth order PDE, this, this equation here, okay? So it's not Einstein or anything more, more common. Good. Uh, I, see, I, I was gonna say, R is the richest scalar of the metric uh, DSD square. So this is a two N dimensional in, in real dimension. Uh, and Rij is the Ricci tensor, right? So this is a fourth order uh, um, uh, in derivative uh, equation. Uh, and moreover, denoting by omega the Kähler form uh, of this transverse foliation and by rho the Ricci form of the same object, then uh, uh, this, um, this connection term here, uh, uh, this P uh, is exactly uh, given by, by the, um, by this, that the, uh, and um, uh, and the two form uh, is related to uh, to the geometric data. So the Kähler form, uh, this uh, this one form, and again R appears here in in a bit strange way. It's kind of very strange. I mean, it's not very natural if you want. But here you have to stick the uh, Ricci scalar, and as well as here in front of this, like a conformal factor. That's what you get from your your killing spinner equation. You start with okay. Uh, uh, it's not very far. It is a bit far in the sense that no, it's not contact, uh, but it's a quasi-contact structure. It's a particular type of quasi-contact structure. The, the, it's, not, it's not always uh, non-zero, the, the, the contact volume. Yeah, right. But you can, you can think of it locally as a kind of contact structure if you want. Uh, here is another correct, okay, two comments. Uh, the first is a characterization which was meant to uh, uh, kind of uh, make a contact with the talk of Anna Fino yesterday. Uh, she's not here today, but I can talk to her when I go back to Torino. Uh, uh, so if you lift this structure uh, to the metric cone, the, the one that I, they, I explained in the previous slide, so you have, to, you have to lift the metric as for the Sasakian case that became Kähler, and then you also have to lift the two form to a three form in this particular way. And this now defines a complex but non kähler geometry, uh, which obey equations almost identical to uh, Chris's uh, equations. Where is Chris? Uh, there. All right. Okay. Uh, in the, but in the case, I mean, in a simplified version, when you just stick alpha prime to zero, so there is no gauge bundle to worry about nothing. I mean, it just uh, it, it, th those equations were in the particular case of alpha prime equal to zero. That's common number one which may be interesting to explore. Um, comment number two, uh, this four order, fourth order PDEs is similar, but different from the Euler-Lagrange equation of for the Calabi's extremal Kähler matrix, which are very popular in, in geometry, right? So uh, those, I mean, one version of, the, of, this, uh, of this equation is, uh, is written here. Uh, and again, R is the richest scalar and Rij is the, is the Ricci tensor, right? So now this equation here, as I said, is a fourth order uh, in, in derivatives, but it's different from the previous one. The only, the only thing they have in common is this uh, box Laplace and operator acting on the Ricci scalar. And these are, uh, these are critical points of Calabi's functional, uh, famously. Uh, this is the Ricci square. Okay, these are two comments. Now, from the last comment, there is a natural question. Is there a functional whose critical points yield uh, one of these new geometries that we people introduced? And the answer is yes. Uh, and this was found in this paper uh, about three years ago, uh, something like that, with, with these collaborators. Um, in, in that paper, and in the, we normally call it as Susie for reasons that I don't want to, I, it doesn't matter. Today, I mainly always call these functions always F some function f to be extremized and here is what needs to be extremized okay so here i wrote this in a form in a way 
which I'm sure you, you can make sense of it. I mean, you, you just, just expand the exponential of this two form and you pick up the correct uh, kind of a measure in each dimension uh, to, to fill out this, uh, this integral. And important, so that's the definition. An important property of this is that actually one can prove what we did in the paper that uh, this depends only on the transverse scalar class and on this uh, on this vector vector field, this canonical vector field that exists uh, on the geometry. Uh, now, this similarly to the to the story of the Sasakian volume needs to be extremized uh, with respect to this uh, vector field uh, psi. But there are some additional uh, equations, or if you want, constraints to be imposed, uh, which are which come from the geometry. Which uh, the second one, for example, comes from the fact that you have this two form, which I mentioned. I call that H, and dual to that, there is uh, there is a, a kind of n minus two form, uh, and then when you integrate that over the various cycles of this uh, of this manifold, you have to you have to ensure that they are integer numbers. So we call them flux quantization in the context uh, of, uh, um, of supergravity. So, so here you have to pick up uh, a basis of the homology of your space, uh, call it sigma A, and integrate this form here. Uh, so you get like N, uh, sorry, uh, in this case, that would be D in the previous notation, a number of how many cycles there are uh, for, for this here. And this is also sort of consistency uh, condition uh, that you have to impose again. And they all uh, look similar, but if you look at the detail of the integrals, they are a bit different. Yeah, because you, your fluxes have to be in integrally uh, quantized. It's a bit like uh, if you have a, uh, yeah, if you, let's suppose you have a, a two form gauge field. Uh, you don't want its flux to be uh, any any old uh, real number, but you want it to be an integer if you want to interpret this as a connection on on a line bundle. And I would say that's the generalization in, in the higher higher dimension. Maybe someone has a better explanation to this. Here, uh, here, or you mean here? Yeah, I think it's not a typo. It's not the same expression. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this this has this has to be extremized, and it's a non-zero object, which I will uh, I will compute it now for you. And this instead is a different object, which has to be zero. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean. Um, you can. I'm, I'm not sure there is any particular advantage, but uh, yes, indeed you can. Um, next transparency will be a bit more concrete, so uh, I can also point out what, which, which kind of... Yes, uh, omega is the Kalev form, and rho is the Ricci form. Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, in this, in the uh, in the Sasaki Einstein case, all of these rows would be equal to omega, but here they're different. Any other question here? Yeah. The physics origin is an integrability condition of a killing spinner equation. Um, or uh, if you, yeah, normally, but not, not always. There are other examples where you get uh, higher. I mean, in five-dimensional supergravity, you get a sixth order e equation, for example. Um, another way, it is also related, uh, um, uh, it is also, I mean, as a, you know, there's a, like a set of equations you have to impose. Uh, and also, it is also related to the, uh, to the, um, to the equation of motion uh, of, uh, of the two form, uh, depending which one you want to impose for, I mean, this is, you have to impose the Bianchi identity, the, the equation of motion, et cetera. Yeah. But, that, but that's the key, right? Because uh, the key to make it non-trivial, because if you didn't have to impose this equation here, uh, the geometry would be to, I mean, uh, there wouldn't be any constraint. You can take any Kähler metric, and obviously this cannot be true. You you might say, what? Well, yeah, you, you can say why this is not Einstein or something else, because 
essentially because there is the flux which which breaks uh, the, the you know it makes it more complicated what, what was the question it is similar you, The, the, the here the origin is different it's, you start from from the uh, from the normal uh, supergravity with the einstein hilbert uh, term coupled to whatever fields you need uh, and then this arises um, as as i said the best way to think about it is a, is a kind of integrability condition of the killing spinner equation the killing spinner equation you have just the connection which acts on the on the killing spinner which is linear so you might think it's a second order but in fact because you have the form and then when you substitute it back and you eliminate uh, you get this fourth order equation okay now uh we, we can work through that in the in kind of the, the general case but if again if i impose that the the, the manifold is toric like a, a kind of simplifying assumption many things become more concrete and, and make it kind of more pleasant to discuss and and simple simpler okay so we assume that this uh, uh manifold is a uh, uh, historic ah sorry uh, one comment uh, uh here um you might be surprised why, why am i talking about uh and arbitrary dimension the, the reason is that the relevant n uh, for supergravity are just three and, and four uh, and that's it uh, but then as a geometry you can discuss it for any n right so uh, in terms of uh, mathematics there is no need to, to restrict to n equal to some particular value okay that was a comment um okay so so you expand the killer class yeah, everything becomes nice and concrete you can take a basis of uh, of your uh, or your uh, two-dimensional homology and then uh, the Kähler class is parameterized by d of these real numbers lambda a um, and then one can define this auxiliary function or, or functional a priori which uh, we call it master volume in fact it's like just the volume i mean it's called master because it, it turns out that it depends uh, on the on the vector and on these uh, Kähler parameters uh, again, uh, like my function f, but in a way is a kind of a, something more uh, fundamental is a sort of a prepotential if I want to use this physics uh, notation something from which everything else can be derived. And indeed, you can see here the formula that relates my function to be extremized to this extremal volume to sorry to this uh, uh, master volume right so that's the that's the function you take derivative with respect to lambda a you sum it you get this and then you you have to extremize the function with respect to the vector field right these other two constraints that appeared in the previous slide then again become uh, simple equations uh, simple algebraic equations to be imposed so then um, everything looks nice and concrete uh, the only catch that you might object is that well unless you give me an expression for this v then i don't know what to do with these equations so let me show you it's not particularly illuminating but there isn't a concrete expression right again it's built out of this determinant three by three determinants here i specified the the case of n equal two um you can construct it in any dimension uh it, it becomes more more cumbersome and it, there is you might think of this as a sort of a iterative procedure you can put it in the computer if you want you know uh, have fun etc but in in the simplest case uh, you can write this in in this uh in this explicit fashion and you can think i mean it does uh, this is actually something that generalizes the sasakian volume uh, by introducing dependence on this scalar parameter uh, on which the sasakian volume wasn't uh, uh, uh wasn't present and in fact if you put them all equal this expression here reduces it's trivial to check to the previous one that appeared in in the in the Sasakian case uh how, however there is a uh, there is a there is some one difference for example is that this master volume is not uh is not obviously that you can put in this kind of Dusterman hackman form and this is something I want to come back to the at the end of the talk uh kind of give a, a equivariant form of the Sasakian volume which is not which is not manifest from from this uh, from the fact that the cone here, as in comment one, I said it's not Kähler. Okay, uh, 
Okay, now it comes the, the, the this this uh, central part uh, is a little bit, uh, if you want, disconnected <laughs> from from the initial part. Uh, the so I'm, maybe I'll I'll, I'll, I'll ask Kim through uh, 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 lightly through these uh, in, uh, transparencies. Um, the the idea is well to kind of make contact with the more recent uh, material um, was to explain that uh, you can construct uh, a typical way in which one can construct these geometries is by taking brains, which have been mentioned in many talks, and, and, and then wrapping them onto some, uh, onto some cycles. Uh, for example, the simplest case was uh, uh, proposed by Maldesena and Nunez uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, when you take your brains and you wrap it on some uh, genus G, uh, Riemann surface, uh, and that's the picture. So in this way, one can produce, you can think as a machine, if you want, that produces uh, new geometries. So new geometries, new solution to supergravity, uh, and new field theories that then someone like Sarah can, can go and, and compute all of these quivers and et cetera, et cetera, right? So that, that's a way to produce uh, um, ADS-CFT dualities. Um, well, okay, so this is a bit of a, Maybe I can skip through these uh, these these uh, kind of transparencies here. This is a how how you preserve supersymmetry. There is something called topological twist. Uh, I actually, I don't want to spend much time here on, on this today. Um, so, uh, as you can see, in 2020, uh, you you say whether it's old or new. Then uh, this setup was further expanded uh, in a paper and then a, and in a series of paper with. Uh, with these collaborators here, uh, where we uh, kind of um, made a, a proposal, which is uh, maybe sounds obvious, but at the time it looked uh, uh, almost um, uh, wrong. Uh, you, you can actually uh, consider supergravity configuration uh, where you wrap your brains on objects which are singular. This was not considered before. Um, and in particular, the object that we consider is a, 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 a trivial uh, type of orbifold from the mathematical point of view. It's a weighted projective space, um, which uh, uh, you can think as a two sphere with two orbifold singularities, which, which then looks a bit like that. And, and it is uh, called, in fact, uh, in, some, uh, in some literature, spindle or, or, or football ball or whatever you want. Okay, so uh, you can repeat this old story uh, now fast forward 20 years later, and then instead of a nice smooth Riemann surface with your uh, uh, genus that you want, uh, you take this object here, uh, has genus zero, but it has these two orbifold singularities, and that leads to some interesting new uh, physics and, and also some interesting, interesting uh, uh, mathematical aspects. So besides the obvious uh, difference, with respect to the previous case, let, let's take as reference the two sphere, the smooth uh, two sphere. Um, uh, of course, there are obvious singularities, but then there are some other features which play then play an important role. Um, so, um, for example, this metric does not admit cur uh, constant curvature. I mean, the metric cannot be a constant curvature ever because of the two different uh, conical uh, deficit angles at the two poles. Uh, However, although it doesn't have a SU2 uh, symmetry, it still has a U1 symmetry for rotation along the, uh, the axis. And uh, uh, this is a comment about supersymmetry, which is something which today, I guess, I'm, I'm skipping through, but it's preserved in a, in a new fashion, which generalizes the, the way in which pr was preserved uh, before. Um, okay, so it's, it's, uh, it has some, uh, some new features, and this new feature will be, will be uh, reflected and inherited by uh, some geometries that we will kind of will on of the type that I discussed at the in the initial part of the talk. Now, from the point of view, again, I'll start here again from the point of view of the uh, of the field theorist. All of these uh, uh, instances, when you wrap your brain on a on a on a on a spindle, let's say, um, then uh, you have uh, um, you, you have a similar story to do what I was describing uh, initially. You have some observable. And this observable has to be extremized over a suitable parameter space, uh, which in, the phys in physical terms correspond to uh, determining the exact R symmetry. Um, this, is, this makes one of the things that makes the story uh, more interesting is the fact that this uh, uh, spindle has U1 symmetry, and therefore uh, 
uh, you have this uh, mixing in quote marks. Uh, so essentially that means when you, when you do your extremal problem, you have one additional parameter. Uh, so um, in addition to the, uh, to the parameters that uh, sort of uh, correspond to the global symmetries of your field theory, you have an extra parameter uh, which is the uh, uh, parameter epsilon. And this is exactly what uh, will become the equivariant parameter for rotation uh, around the axis of, of the spindle. Um, and another thing which then plays a role is that all of these uh, uh, functions that one can construct in field theory uh, can be, uh, and this is a kind of observation at this level. It, it's not really, there is no proof at this level. It's only an observation. In, in all cases, one can decompose these functions in, some, in terms of something more elementary, which, which, which are still functions, but they're kind of more uh, elementary and then they're called blocks and, and kind of uh, uh, compose them in um, some in essentially in different ways. It's referred to as gluing of, the, of these blocks and they encode uh, uh, the, uh, universal properties of this field theory. Uh, okay, so in all of these uh, cases where you take your favorite brain, you wrap on the, on the spindle for the moment, uh, uh, and then uh, there is a field theory, then in all of these cases, there should be uh, an extreme problem uh, in supergravity. Uh, and, 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 and then if you've done remove uh, the word of supergravity in geometry, right? So based on the, on the sort of the knowledge and uh, examples uh, at the time, uh, about uh, two or three years ago, then in a first paper with, the, with my postdoc Federico uh, Faedo, we, we made a conjecture. Uh, we, we said that, well, we, we proposed that uh, in all, let's say in all possible cases, well, we, we, I mean, this is almost true. So in all possible cases where you can take a brain and, and wrap on the spindle, then <laughs> this function that you need to extremize uh, you, you can write this, uh, in the, you can decompose in this in terms of these uh, uh, more uh, elementary blocks. And then you can, uh, you, I mean, this conjecture, of course, was based on many examples which work. Uh, and then one can uh, test it. We can make various tests uh, in other cases where, which were then uh, uh, kind of uh, worked out uh, later. And it always uh, works, let's say, from the, from the uh, field theory point of view. And again, on shell, which means when you plug it back the critical value, of these functions that needs to be extremized, this corresponds to various observables, which uh, uh, are not important today. Uh, so here, well, just to demystify these uh, blocks, they're just trivial functions, they're just trivial monomials, uh, okay? So this is just a, a, a um, kind of a square root of, a, of this uh, for, for a product, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these are well known. Now, the next step, which is now the uh, kind of appetizer for uh, the, the last part of the talk, and I need to check my time so that I gauge my final part. All right, okay, very good, uh, very good. So I can slow down a bit. Um, yeah, so the, the, the next thing I want to discuss is that this idea of uh, wrapping um, brain over, over the spindle, then has a natural generalization, which comes about if you think in terms of, uh, of uh, toric geometry, because then you can think of the spindle, or namely the way they project this space, as the simplest possibly, or in fact, the, the only toric orbifold in, uh, in, two, in two real dimensions. Uh, and then you can say, well, okay, if that works in two dimensions, maybe you, I can manufacture some situation where instead of a two-dimensional orbifold, I have a, a higher dimensional orbifold. Uh, in most applications that I can think uh, uh, about, uh, higher here would be four, but still, nevertheless, again, I can phrase my, my, my framework in general dimension uh, just to be, to be sure. So, okay, so this is like a, uh, uh, toric orbifolds in a, in a nutshell, in a half, uh, half a page. Uh, and this, this comes back, I mean, the, the toric geometry picture, which I uh, uh, highlighted in, uh, in my initial uh, discussion of, uh, of Sasaki Einstein comes back. Uh, in a sense, it's more familiar because here it's compact, but in another sense, it's less familiar because now we are in the orbifold realm. So uh, before I didn't have these orbifold uh, singularities. Um, okay, so uh, uh, um, then uh, any toric uh, two-dimensional 
or before will be a, a, a space which is a, which is has a, which is symplectic, um, and then there will be a symplectic form exactly the same as before. Here everything is compact, and there'll be a, 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 an effectively uh, effective torus action uh, uh, and middle the middle dimension. Uh, same moment maps. Here I give you another uh, important uh, information which uh, I, I didn't need uh, previously. Um, to any um, to any facet, uh, there is also uh, uh, I mean if you if you have a complex uh, structure which you normally always want, uh, uh, you can think of this as divisors. Uh, and uh, in these coordinates here, the divisors uh, are defined by uh, these equations here. So the, the divisors are just co-dimension one complex co-dimension one. Um, Surfaces in the in your in your orbifolds, and, and these are the equations that define them. So these VA are the same VA as uh, that we were discussing around here, right? Uh, now here, if you if you want to visualize this little n here is two, and we are therefore our our orbifold is four dimensional, and and uh, and uh, the picture which is the the image of the of the of the moment map is a is a convex hull of of points here the picture has four vertices that would be my little d equal to four but again you can take any any number of uh, vertices and edges um and here the killer parameters which appeared already in some other uh, context uh, uh, they give you the position basically the position of these edges as you move lambda you're changing the shape of the or the various edges uh, and to any of these divisor there is also a natural associated line bundle uh, with with first and class, which actually can be constructed, that can be written down explicitly. I think was given in the paper of Gilman, uh, and uh, and in terms of this uh, of this data. So everything is very explicit. So uh, then, um, well, there, there are two kind of uh, developments. One is that we we manage to construct uh, explicit supergravity solutions, where you have one of these four dimensional compact orbifolds. Quite complicated, very complicated metric, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another another di direction is that based on that example and uh, our uh, uh, illuminations, uh, then we come came came um, came up with a, with another conjecture, which now uh, is a sort of a, a higher dimensional version of the previous conjecture. So we said, well, all the time that you have to one one type of geometry which involves one of these four dimensional orbifold. Uh, we are going to say, well, you need to extremize this function here in order to find solutions. Now, this function here, uh, again, I, I present it as pulled out of the hat because I want to make it uh, look uh, like uh, amazing what we did later. I'm, I'm joking. Um, but initially, it's just an inspiration. Uh, and then later, we will be able to prove this by using uh, uh, essentially equivariant uh, uh, localization. Anyway, at the moment, uh, this is a function which depends, it's a sum over the fixed points, which is a smoking gun for equivalent localization. And, and then it depends on the, on the equivalent parameters. And since the, now there are, uh, we, are, we have a two torus, there are only two. And then it depends on these vectors. And since we are in two dimensions, there are no three by three determinants, but there are sort of two by two determinants, which is what these objects are, right? Uh, the only thing which is slightly non-standard is that everything is decorated by by these Ds, uh, which are essentially the order of the orbifold singularities at the fixed points. Right? You you wouldn't have these these uh, Ds here if your uh, orbifold was a manifold. Um, so this treatment of toric orbifolds, uh, I think it's due to uh, Lerman and Tolman. Uh, at least this is the standard reference I I know. Um, okay, so that's the function that we propose you have to extremize, and it depends the data in which depends is is this uh, toric data, the two equivalent parameters, and uh, these delta i's, which are which are these uh, what they call chemical potentials, they are the fugacities, namely the the parameters associated to the basically to the to the symmetries of the theory. So depending on which theory you have, there would be um, maybe different uh, quivers, maybe very complicated, but in the end, it will be always essentially the same number of global symmetries. Okay, so that's a little recap. Uh, in all of these uh, uh, 
conformal field theory examples, uh, one observed constructed in this way, so by wrapping brains on the spindle or on higher dimensional, namely four dimensional or before, one observed that there exists an extremal function, namely a function of some parameters that needs to be extremized. Uh, and this takes uh, the form of a, of a, uh, of a more, more elementary function, some which we call block, uh, some over the fixed point of the orbifold. So this was already, uh, of course, contained in the spindle, but that wasn't very manifest because there were only two contributions, and there are many ways in which two contributions could have arisen, but arise. Uh, so then, uh, Okay, in four dimensions, it's more obvious because if you have five or uh, nine fixed points, you'd have five or nine uh, different contributions. And here then, uh, then uh, there is, a, there is a, well, one question is, uh, all of this uh, is uh, relatively well understood in the case of uh, um, M2, M3, M3 brains. These are the geometries which are descri this, um, uh, described by this GK geometry, which we spent some time on, but other brains, actually, there is no such uh, well-developed understanding of the geometry, um, right? So um, there are other cases where much less is known about the general structure of the geometry. So essentially it's more a kind of, kind of a case by case, you find the solution, someone else finds the solution and so on. Um, there isn't such a kind of clear geometric setup for, for other situations for which nevertheless, there are already many examples. So those are kind of a bit behind. They are waited to be put on, on the same uh, ground. Uh, in all of these problems uh, that, uh, that uh, I discussed, uh, the data always that enters are some topological data. Uh, here, the, the topological data that would be namely this in the toric case, these Vs. You could, as I said, you can do also non-toric and that there will be more complicated uh, uh, churn classes, and et cetera, et cetera. But otherwise here, everything boils down to uh, uh, combinatorics and these. Uh, and, and the choice of this vector field, namely uh, equivar equivalent data. So all in all, putting all these together, uh, it, it suggests that actually equivalent localization should be useful in holography. And that's what, uh, with Alberto Zaffaroni, we, we sat down to, to do uh, earlier uh, uh, this year. So let's finish the, the well, finish not yet, but the last part of the talk would be about uh, equivalent localization. Um, I'm sure that actually, I mean, most of you would know much more than what I know about this, but nevertheless, let me go through a little bit of uh, uh, what, what this is and what, what is, why it's useful for our um, applications. So. Well, here, if you want, the, the, the interaction with the mathematics is opposite to what was before. Before, we were finding new things to, to be, I mean, like kind of new geometries uh, to, 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 to study. Here, we take from the, from the well-known theory of uh, uh, equivariant uh, uh, integration and equivariant homology, we take the results that we need in order to, to find some, to apply this in supergravity. Right, so we consider you consider a manifold or in fact an orbifold with a, with a torus action. Um, and then uh, uh, if there is a vector field which lies in the Lie algebra, one can define the, the, uh, this uh, twisted uh, or equivariant uh, uh, um, derivative, which is the exterior derivative plus the contraction with the vector field. And this object maps uh, P forms uh, into the sum of, uh, uh, well, from here, P plus one forms and P minus one forms. So it acts naturally on, on, uh, on firm forms with multi-degree, multi uh, which are called sometimes polyform or multiform. And we denote them as alpha with this T. And such a multiform is said to be equivalently closed if it satisfies this equation here, right? So if it's closed with respect to the uh, equivalent differential, one can build some cohomology here, but of course I will not need uh, all of that for my purpose today. So uh, first of all, to simplify even further the discussion, if you set K equal to N, so half the dimension of your, your uh, space, which is a manifold or an orbifold, then we are back in the toric case, which is our, our comfort zone. And then uh, the uh, berlin Bern atia bot uh, fixed point theorem, then uh, in a nutshell, again, states that if you have a multiform which is equivalently closed, then its integral over the manifold or, or orbifold is given by a sum of fixed points, 
where uh, you pick up the, the zero form part of the, of the multiform, and then there is this uh, kind of a correction term, which involves the order of the, uh, of the orbifold singularity, which is one if, you, if there is no orbifold at the fixed point, and uh, uh, the Euler uh, number uh, uh, at, the, at the fixed point of the tangent bundle. In the, uh, in the paper, we proposed that a key object that uh, we should consider in the context of supergravity is an object very well known in the context of uh, uh, the theory of equivariant uh, uh, cohomology, which is sometimes, I guess, called uh, equivariant volume, right? So this equivariant volume, then uh, we start seeing, of course, a relation to previous uh, volumes that appeared. Right, so I, I uh, on purpose I wrote my Sasakian volume initially exactly in this form here, um, and in fact that shows that that was itself an in, in, in example of equivalent volume. But this is something more uh, more general. Um, I, I, I should have I, yeah I, sorry I forgot to to put the reference. I should have mentioned that Maxime has been working on that as well in, in different contexts. Um, so it's something which is a natural a, a, a natural object to consider. Uh, uh, it depends manifestly on the equivalent parameters because they uh, they are hidden uh, in the in this Hamiltonian here, which is just uh, uh, linear in the equivalent parameters. Uh, but also it depends on the on the shape of the of the polytope, right? Uh, through the the Keeler parameters um, uh, lambda a. Again, uh, I'll, uh, I'll well, in fact, uh, it appears here. Um, so that's the expression, the formal expression. And, but then this, thanks to the to the uh, to the fixed point theorem, can be evaluated, right? And if you evaluate because this uh, the the equivariant symplectic form is closed, then this has a, a very nice, a very explicit expression in terms of the uh, of the of the data. So the toric data, which are which are uh, hidden in this epsilon a, uh, maybe maybe I should. Uh, it's a bit slow this, but. It's a good point since they appeared here. Yeah, this epsilon here, here are defined here. They depend on the on the data VA. Okay, so it's a very concrete expression that you can you can work with, right? And uh, for the physicists, uh, this looks like a generating function, and that's uh, in fact that's something that we will uh, exploit, right? Like from here, we are the idea is that you can extract all that you need. In your in your geometric problem, uh, exactly as you extract all the correlation function from your generating functional. In fact, uh, let's see the interpretation in the compact case, which is what I was discussing so far. Although, in fact, then we can uh, immediately apply this also in a non-compact case. So, in the compact case, then we have this relation, which I already, I guess, I already wrote. Uh, and already uh, referred to the fact that this was due to Gilman. Here, with respect to the previous one, I'm decorating the, this with the equivariant. So now this is the equivariant symplectic form, and here is the equivariant first in class. Otherwise, I wrote that already previously, right? And uh, if you if you remember that, uh, and and you plug it into here, you plug it in, then it's immediate that you can interpret this equivariant volume as the generating functional of the equivariant intersection numbers, which are defined in this way. So you take your equivariant forms, uh, um, equivariant two forms, and, and, um, and you compute the integral. Um, obviously, uh, here, if these were non-equivariant, uh, you would say that I'm stupid to integrate this object, but because they are equivariant, then you can integrate them, and that makes perfectly sense. Uh, and they, these are exactly, uh, uh, you know, like um, derivatives of uh, p, p derivatives of the equivalent volume. And here is the expression. Another interpretation is that you can also interpret, you know, once you write it, uh, you factor out the factor of, of, of pi, which, uh, which they appear here. And here, Barbara, here, the factor of pi is important. <laughs> 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 it's our joke from yesterday. Um, you know, uh, you get the factor of two pi to the end. They uh, they cancel out, and you get just the volume of your of your compact uh, polytope. Good. With this measure, uh, with this measure a to the e to the h. Now let's look at the non-compact case, which is perhaps the the 
perhaps the newest uh, kind of uh, um, use of this, uh, of this uh, formalism. Then uh, again, because of this converge of this factor here, if your geometry is non-compact, um, I mean, quite generally, we can, we can assume, let's say we, this is not proved rigorously, but in a, uh, you know, if you assume that your geometry is a cone, then the, the integral uh, will converge and will not give any, any problem uh, at infinity. So it makes sense to define this uh, equivariant volume. If you, if you think of this definition here, uh, even if the space is non-compact, but there will be some differences because in the non-compact space, you can't use, uh, at least you can't use uh, naively your, your cohomology relations and so on. So, so things which you, you would think that are true wouldn't, won't be true anymore in the non-compact space, but some, th some things are true. In particular, what is true, uh, and this follows from the Atia Bot, uh, uh, Berlin Bern thing, is this, exp this sort of expression here. So uh, maybe here it, uh, it's worth a picture. Uh, although you have uh, something which is like a cone, something like that, uh, right? But once you partially resolve it uh, and you put some uh, kind of a fixed point here, then uh, this, this integral will pick up contributions only from, from the fixed point here and won't be pick up anything from infinity. So it makes perfect sense uh, to define this object even for non-compact uh, um, varieties or orbifolds. Um, in particular, uh, you can take a, a partial resolution of a Calabi-Yau singularity, right? So you take your favorite uh, Calabi-Yau singularity, say the conifold or whatever you want, uh, and compute this object, right? And, right? and that gives you an explicit expression. Then you can do various things with that. You can, for example, for, I mean, consider this uh, formal expansion, uh, uh, this uh, kind of a Taylor expansion, but not quite because each of these terms, it's a, it's a homogeneous polynomial like um, this VK. So it's a polynomial of degree K in Lambda, uh, but it's a rational function in Epsilon uh, of uh, homogeneous or degree K minus one. So this rationality is, is a feature of the non-compactness. In the compact case, you would see that there, there isn't anything uh, in the denominator. Everything is a polynomial in the in the equivalent parameters. Uh, so that that's a feature, right? Uh, and, and and this gives you exactly uh, the 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 order. Now let's look at the uh, so so in principle all these infinite all these infinite sequence of these uh, volumes. This is like an infinite sequence of, of volumes, and I'd say that all of them should have some interpretation. So. Again, quoting, uh, maybe quoting one, uh, one sentence which I read in Maxim's uh, paper, this is a bit like experimental mathematics in the sense that we are now experimenting a bit with these uh, objects and see what we can get from them. Although there isn't yet a, a complete uh, picture. The, okay, so first observation, and this actually one can, one can prove, the, uh, the zeroth order term here in this expansion is exactly the Sasakan volume. That's observation number one. Uh, moreover, the n minus one term in this infinite sequence of uh, uh, volumes is exactly this master volume, which I, which I presented earlier. And uh, it's then easy to, to prove by, by using the equations which I wrote earlier, that the, the object to be extremized, which I said, well, I was gonna call it uh, uh, F, but here I go back, I went back to the, notation of the paper to distinguish it from, from the rest. So this refers, ex, I mean, particularly to this context of GK geometry that I was talking about, right? So that's these boxes here are specific to that context. And here, as I said, the master volume picks up the N minus one term in this uh, expansion of the equivalent volume and the object to be extremized, it's the N minus two level. So in, a, in, a, in a, the punchline is that the equivalent volume of the Calabi-Yau singularity captures and generalizes at once the Sasakian volume and, and the master volume. Uh, but then, okay, that leaves, a, okay. First of all, it gives, this, gives, uh, uh, essentially, uh, this gives essentially a way to, um, to understand the equivalent version of the master volume, which I said was a missing uh, ingredient. So this is interesting, but I mean, it's not super exciting, but one can, I mean, one, one, basically one can give a, 
uh, a, a presentation where the master volume the master volume picks up contribution for freak for fixed points uh, and in particular if you apply these to the case where you had uh, brains wrapped on the spindle there are only two fixed points uh, and then uh, right so the, the case of the spindle is like in this picture would be something like that right? only two fixed points uh, and you pick up contribution from these fixed points and then you can write the equivariant volume of the Calabiao of the full Calabiao becomes you can write it as the as the sum of the fixed point of two reduced equivariant volume associated to the fiber so like the spindle is the base uh, and and then there is some fiber which we we can we, we took again to, again to be Calabiao um, for simplicity uh, and that's what's relevant for the supergravity constructions um, so that reproduces a result which was proved in earlier paper uh, previous year with his collaborators and that took like almost 100 pages to give you an idea and here it comes from one line so that sort of gives you the idea of the power of this uh, formalism um, but what is the geometric or physical interpretation of of these uh, uh, of these objects uh, um, you know for different case in fact if anyone in the audience has any comment I'll be very happy to to discuss uh, <clears throat> so uh, what we did so far in the in the paper uh, which is published but then we have already uh, new results uh, which are, we are working on we propose that for the other brains so for those set of geometries which are not described by gk geometry which i said they're not quite well understood yet i mean uh, not as well understood as gk geometry we proposed uh, that in fact from the equivalent volume you can extract all the times the um, I mean, in this set of examples, which does not cover all the possible examples that you can construct, but it covers, you know, a, a fair amount of uh, examples. Then, in all these cases, we we propose that uh, you can, the, the the function to be extremized is exactly uh, one of these uh, uh, one of these uh, terms in the infinite expansion of the equivariant volume, uh, where where k one depends on which case you are. So there would be a number for m five, another number from d four, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also the constraint that uh, in the GK geometry are quite clear uh, the, why you have to impose, as I was explaining, they come from some uh, 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 flux quantization or, or Dirac quantization condition, if you want to be more physicist, etc. Uh, here, uh, it's some geometric uh, thing which comes out naturally. Uh, you, you have these uh, vectors and uh, kind of the, they give a, a map and the kernel of this map defines these integers. And, and, and this is what, uh, again, experimentally, we have to impose in order to solve our problem. Um, and in all these cases, we have reproduced this, uh, this expression here, which was uh, conjecture in one of my two conjectures in, a, um, in, the, in the paper with Faedo two years ago. And here, I, I should also mention that at the same time, uh, my collaborators, which in this case, they are a different uh, set, they also ended up working on something similar and they have proposed a, 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 a slightly different, but again, based on equivalent localization approach, but uh, without involving the equivalent volume. So the, the, yeah, the, there is also this other paper which appeared uh, the same day, in fact. Okay, so outlook and recap. So through the holographic duality, whatever that means, the existence of well-established extremization principle in conformal field theory implies that there must be an array of new extremization principles in geometry. And uh, the equivalent localization uh, must play a role in holography, both in field theory, and this was known since Vestum in 2007, uh, although uh, recently we have worked on some non-trivial generalization which involved orbifold, which was not done until now, so this is another talk which uh, I will not. I did not give today. Uh, I would. I would give it somewhere else. Uh, but uh, in fact, today I talked about the, the fact that there is an application in supergravity, and and this is new, right? Uh, we expect that the equivalent volume is a central object and encoding several, if not all, extremal problems in uh, supersymmetric geometries. And we are working on various extensions of the of the few which I presented as sketched here, uh, and maybe just also finally let I want also to go, go back to one of the um, issues in the initial part of the talk, 
there are several interesting open mathematical questions, I think, uh, which stem from, from the work that uh, I did with my collaborators and other people in the community did, uh, which is, for example, here is just one uh, kind of a, a blatant example, prove the existence of, of solution to this uh, uh, complicated fourth order equation. Um, right, so that's an open problem. Uh, as I said, in the toric case, uh, the corresponding problem, which is uh, presumably much simpler, was solved uh, only uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, in this case, since the geometries are something which is, uh, again, relatively recent, about five, six years ago, uh, the problem of, uh, uh, of uh, solve, I mean, proving existence is open. Uh, so our work, um, in, uh, apart from defining and giving many, many examples, if you want to give some necessary conditions, um, but it would be it would be nice to also have a sufficient ex, uh, conditions uh, for existence. So so so, that, so that's one uh, one case. But then uh, again, there are many 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 other cases. So so maybe uh, uh, if I want to to refer also to uh, Anna's talk, and that's something which I o o often say to my uh, mm, colleagues and friends, uh, yeah, geometers, uh, they like very much uh, Chris's uh, system. And, and they say that they work on uh, Strominger Hall, uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, which is very nice. But there are many other systems which are apparently ignored by the differential geometry community. And uh, I keep wondering why. And it's an invitation for people working in geometry to get interested in other problems in addition to, to Chris's one. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Equivalent parameters? Well, this means I failed in my talk. <laughs> uh, I was trying to explain uh, uh, one of the messages I wanted to, to explain was this. Yeah, these uh, um, the equivalent parameters are um, at least one interpretation. Uh, they're, they're interpreted as, um, well, in the field theory, which is maybe the, the clearest uh, uh, incarnation, there are fugacities for the symmetries. So if you have an index like Sarah wrote this morning, uh, and, and you have a, a which will depend on uh, on parameters. And this index will depend exactly on on these equivalent parameters. Uh, I mean, this story, I would say it's uh, unrelated uh, uh, physically, maybe mathematically it could be, but it's unrelated to the geometrical engineering and, and that story. So here, the, the um, equivalent volume uh, or it, it's some part extracted from it are uh, uh, essentially, they are uh, proved in some way or another to be the functions that you need to extremize in order to have a supergravity solution. So they play the role of uh, uh, the Sasakian volume or the Calabi functional or uh, the Futaki invariant or whatever you need to be kind of uh, uh, put it to zero or extremize in order to have a, a, the existence of some geometry. The, um, let me think. Um, no, no. So, so, okay, okay. Here, here's the question. So, the supergravity. When you have, when you have a solution in supergravity, there is no there is no equivalent parameter, because there the equivalent parameter is already its, its critical value. So it's a number, right? So you don't see it in the solution itself. So in order to see these, we, we need to do this uh, thing that we like to do, 
to define uh, a geometry which is off shell, which means it's something more general, that it's not satisfying the equation of supergravity. In fact, it kind of satisfies some of them, but not all of them. And what remains to be satisfied is precisely encoded by these various objects, in, and which now we kind of understand they can also be encoded in the equivalent volume. So the, the equivalent parameters, which have a clear geometrical interpretation, uh, only at the at the critical point in supergravity they they assume uh, um, a well defined um, interpretation. In field theory, the, you can they have a very well defined interpretation even off shell because uh, uh, in, in the field theory language, being on being, being at the critical point kind of means that you are at the conformal, roughly speaking, you know you haven't identified the exact R symmetry, but you can also define your field theory for arbitrary uh, uh, R symmetries. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so your question, I would, I would rephrase it in my context as a, is there uh, uh, a, a, a solution of the supergravity equations which depends on the equivalent parameter? And I don't think there is so far, it's a very good question. Even in, even in the very old Sasakian story, no one has found a solution that depends on this parameter. So if you have the parameters, it's not yet the solution. Only when you have extremized becomes a solution. But, but maybe there is more we can discuss. Yeah. 